in there, he, he talks about a lot of different things. He talks about different kinds of readers and what, what those readers are, are looking for. He talks about the kind of reader who reads something because, oh, it's expected of you. You're, you know, you ought to read Crime and Punishment or you ought to read, you know, Anna Karenina or War and Peace or some other, you know, Moby Dick, you know, uh, versus the individual who reads because they love to read. And he talks about, you know, taste in reading. And, and one of the most important things that he says there is he, he talks about the different kind of readers and he talks about the different kinds of books. And he doesn't necessarily talk about good or bad books. He talks about good and bad readers. Good, good readers are those, Lewis argues, who will go back to the same books over and over and over because those books are things that the readers continually find. It doesn't mean good readers don't read new books. Not by any means, because reader was a, a Lewis was a voracious reader. I mean, he talks, he makes it sound like the only stuff he read was you know five hundred years old or older, but he was very well read in twenty early twentieth century literature and psychology. I mean, he'd read all of Freud, he'd read Marx, he'd read um, Wittgenstein and other philosophers and stuff. He just didn't care for any of it. Okay, you know, so what would he do? He'd go back to, you know, Spencer, Dante, Chaucer, Bo uh, Boethius, Beowulf, you know, things like that, and read that over and over. But what, he, what he's really getting at in that book is what is the effect of the book on the reader? I mean, he's, he's really, you know, what I call a, a proto-reader response theorist. Reader response literary theory is all about what is the reader's response to the text that they are reading. And that's what Lewis is arguing. I mean, what, what he is saying is you ought to read books, first and foremost, for the response that they promote in you. How do you respond? How do you uh, understand? What does it do to you? And to that end, one of the things he, he suggests um, pretty clearly, is don't approach any book with any preconceived notion. Try as much as possible to, you know, and I do this with, with upper division lit students and grad students as, as well, is, you know, get all the literary theory out of your mind. You know, this is especially important with graduate students, you know, when I'm doing Old English and Beowulf or Middle English and Chaucer, you know, all that stuff that, that you've been, you know, that's been forced into your mind through grad school classes, forget it. Just block it all out and try to let whatever the writer is saying flow on you like water. Let it rush over you and let it, you know, sink and get down into the, the, the eddies and pools and cracks of your mind and stuff and let let it work. Just let it work. If it does work, then you have a reception to that. If it doesn't work, it doesn't mean it's a bad book. I'll be honest. Moby Dick, I cannot stand. <laughs> you know, I've been a PhD for 20 years, and I've never finished it. Every time I've tried, I get to that big, long section in the middle on cetology and whales, and my brain just, <laughs> I mean... You might as well unplug me from the wall because I'm dead at that point. Okay? I can never get past it. I had a professor when I was an undergraduate who I think, if I remember the story correctly, she fell in love with Moby Dick when she was like 12. And you'd go into her office for a session or something, and she had Moby Dick cartoons. Like all, you know, and you're thinking, where in the world do you get Moby Dick? She got them. <laughs> she found them. I mean, the New Yorker, New York Times, all these, you know, magazines, and the walls were just plastered. But And that's everything she did was Moby Dick related, okay? Um, it obviously connected with her in <laughs> some, some way. So, that's a nice little segue into um, 
Chrysostom, whose name, Chrysostom, means golden mouth. Okay? He got that nickname um, because of the rhetorical power of his homilies. And we have, what, six in here? Yeah, we have six homilies here. He delivered hundreds of homilies. Um, many of those homilies are still read today. Uh, some of those homilies are still actually read and delivered in churches. We won't talk about the, the Paschal or Paschal homily today, but we will Tuesday, uh, Thursday or next Tuesday, one of the two days. Um, but that homily, the Pascha homily, is actually read every year on Pascha in all the Orthodox Church. It doesn't matter whether it's an English-speaking Orthodox Church or it's the church in Christ the Cathedral, uh, Christ the Savior Cathedral in Moscow, or the Greek Orthodox Church, or Albanian, or wherever. You might want to explain what Pascha is. Uh, oh, sorry. Pascha is Easter. Yeah. <laughs> In the Orthodox Church, it's just the word for Passover, um, but it's it's um, it's non-Western Easter, non-Western. Okay, um, but that homily has been delivered for roughly sixteen hundred years. Okay, um, because of one, it's brief. I mean, it's pretty brief. It only takes like five minutes to read the whole thing, ten minutes, you know, at most. Um, and two, he pretty much says everything that needs to be said. In it. Now, we're going to look today, hopefully, at these first two of these homilies on Lazarus and the rich man. And I understand why your editor gave the title of this on wealth and poverty. But it's a little misleading because it's, it's not really on wealth and poverty. It's on Lazarus. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus. But she uses that to, in the introduction at least, to talk a little bit more about wealth and poverty. But notice, especially in the second one, I think it's the second one, if they haven't just blurred together in my mind. I'm pretty sure it's the second one. How much he really gets into what wealth and poverty mean. Okay? Um, a little bit of background. I mean, you've got the introduction, and you got a little bit of biographical stuff. Um, he wasn't baptized till he was twenty, which is kind of odd for an early church father. Many of the fathers were were baptized as children, but he was baptized when he was twenty. Uh, became a deacon, and then later on a priest when he was in his thirties. Was made archbishop of Antioch and Constantinople. Pissed off the emperor excuse me, Empress, and was removed. Um, he eventually died in exile and died of illness from, East, from the rough exile uh, in the cold and snow. Okay? And he did not live a very long life, 57 years, I think. Yeah, 57 years, from 350 to 407. Um, and, and had a pretty rough life from the period of roughly 390 to until his death. I mean, the last 15, 20 years uh, were in and out of office. He got deposed. He was brought back. He got deposed again. He got brought, got brought back. The people loved him. The congregations in Antioch and in Constantinople loved him. It was the people in power that didn't. And you can kind of see why after uh, reading a couple of these. You can also probably see why, you know, he probably wouldn't go over so well with um, the Bill Gateses of his uh, congregation. Okay? So. Wait, not Bill, Bill Gateses, really? No, oh, the law. Matthew. Yeah, I mean. Like, you know, he's exactly the kind of wealthy person that... Um, oh, you think so? <laughs> or, that's how he's normally painted as, because he, does he doesn't even run his company anymore. He devotes time to the charity work. <laughs> no. 
We'll talk about that okay. when we get to <laughs> Dr. Sherman. Uh, yeah, go quick, ahead. Before you get started, I was wondering, how are these being preserved? Because there's all sorts of reactions to uh, the crowd he's talking to. So was there somebody, you know, transcribing this? or? or I don't think so. What do you, first of all, what do you mean there are reactions? Um, I mean, he, he embeds within his sermons. He says things like, now I know what you're thinking, and, well, you know, you're not applauding, and that's good. Yeah. Okay, no, we, we do... anticipatory? Yeah, well, no, it's not necessarily participatory, but we do know, um, your introduction mentions this, yeah, that, you're, that he, packed, he packed the places out. But I mean, he was anticipating... Potential reactions, non-reactions. Yeah, some of I mean, sermons, some of some of that is is going on. Well, but he, I mean, in that one passage, I think that you're thinking of, he, um, and I think it's in the second one. The second, yeah. He makes the comment. Are you listening to this in silence? Page four. I'm much happier. For applause and praise make me more famous. Okay. But the silence makes you more virtuous. Now, he's called Chrysostom not because some council of church fathers said, oh, he's the great golden mouth one. Everything that flows from his mouth is worth. He was called Chrysostom by the people. They were the one who began calling him that. Okay. Um, pe people would packed the churches to listen to him, not necessarily because they were so, you know, morally moved, but they, they packed the churches to listen to him, much like about 1,200 years later, um, parishioners packed St. Paul's Cathedral in London to hear John Dunn deliver sermons. Okay? Because Dunn would deliver fireworks of sermons. Not hellfire and brimstone, by any means. Just pick up any sermon by Dunn. You can find them online. Pick up any sermon by Dunn, and you read it, and it kind of sounds like, you know, it's going to put you to sleep. But what Dunn does in his sermons is he paints pictures. And usually the pictures are very architectural in origin. He talks about the the substrate and the ground floor and the walls and the second floor and the walls and the roof, etc. And he does this all by keeping his audience involved. Okay, are you with me? Are you following now? We've entered, we've gone from the porch into the main room and we've gone down the hallway into, and the porch and the main room and the hallway all stand for elements of God's grace or something else. Okay, um, Chrysostom does the same. Okay, keep in mind if you read the introduction, what was he a master of? Rhetoric. rhetoric. Well, what is rhetoric? It's the use of certain tools, certain linguistic tools, certain uh, compositional tools to, for what end? To persuade. That's all it is. It's to persuade. Okay, which is why St. Paul says you shouldn't use rhetoric. St. Paul says, let the Spirit speak through you. Don't sit there and try and come up with all different kinds of figures of speech, etc. He's got tons of figures of speech. Why? It makes it more memorable. It makes it more applicable. Okay, so go back to the first one. And notice what he, what he says. And if you read the introduction... You know, the first one was on January the 2nd. January 1st was the Feast of Saturnalia. So he says, you know, yesterday was the feast day of Satan. He just, you know, uh, just, yeah, just kind of off. I mean, just kind of, you know, off the, uh, right off, exactly, right off the bat. And, and without really, you know, you get the impression like, you know, there's not even a pause. It's just, you know, stating a simple fact. And all the audience goes, yes, you know, praise Jesus, you know. It was funny because I, I I decided at first to save time by skipping the introduction, <laughs> and then was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna have to go back and read the introduction <laughs> immediately on the first line because I had no. You know, well, and look what else he says there. 
Although it was a feast day of Satan, you preferred to keep a spiritual feast, receiving our words with great goodwill, spending most of the day here in church. Notice, not spending part of the day, not spending an hour, most of the day, drinking a drunkenness of self-control. How, how do you drink a drunkenness of self-control? You revel in self-control, dancing in the course of Paul, blah, blah, blah. You shared a drinking bowl, which did not pour out undiluted wine, but was filled with spiritual instruction, probably talking about the Eucharist. You became a flute and a lyre for the Holy Spirit, probably talking about singing hymns and such, while others dance for the devil out there, you know, in New Orleans. <laughs> you prepared yourselves by your occupation here to be spiritual instruments and vessels. And then he goes on and says some other stuff. He tells... Uh, tells his congregation not to give up trying to correct those who drink excessively or doing our duty in, in giving salutary advice even if no one heeds us. In other words, even if they don't pay any attention, you still try. Now, this kind of runs counter, this little comment here, to what we're going to see him say in the second homily. And what he says in the second homily will run, should I say this or not, will run almost completely in the face of and contrary to what a huge number of Christians today will say in terms of, you know, giving alms or giving aid to the homeless. Okay, we'll talk about that when we get to it. So, what does he say? I've proved sufficiently we must never desert those who are fallen, even if we know in advance that they will not heed us. We must never cast off. We must never leave aside those who are fallen. Even if we know well in advance, they're not going to listen to us. So why not? Why not just say, oh yeah, well, you know, thank you, and <laughs> go on your own merry way. Because it's not about them and what they do with it. It's about us and us doing it. Okay. The virtue is in the individual doing not necessarily in the individual receiving. Okay, Why? Because they're still free agents. They still have their own volition. They can choose to accept. They can choose to deny. That's fine. All right? So he goes on and he talks about, you know, the words of St. Paul, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Well, if you take those words of Paul literally, then what does that mean? Even if you're out there with the drunkards at the Saturnalia feast... Do all to the glory of God. So what does that obviously not mean? It doesn't mean you get so drunk that you take all your clothes off and run up and down, you know, Bourbon Street. Maybe like, you interpret it that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jason might interpret that a little bit differently, let's say. Jason does that for the glory of God. Okay. Um, as David did. <laughs> so we're going to skip over a little bit. And so he goes on to talk about the parable. There was a rich man living in great wickedness. Man was not tested by any misfortune. Everything flowed to him as if from a fountain. Okay. It's evident that he lived in wickedness, both from the end which fell to his lot and before the end for his contempt from for the poor man. In other words, these are the proofs that he was wicked. One, we find out what happened to him after he died. And two, and even more importantly than the first reason, we saw how he behaved when alive. Okay? For if he did not give alms to this man who was continually prostrate at his gate, lying before his eyes, whom he had to see every day once or twice, or many times as he went and out, for the man was not lying in the street, nor in a hidden or narrow place. What's he getting at there? He wasn't lying in the street or in a hidden place. He's like... If this was the gate to his house, he was lying right here. And so the rich man had to come and sit and step over him. All right? What, what Chrysostom is emphasizing is there is no way the rich man could have not known about Lazarus. So, but where the rich man, whenever he made his entrance or exit, was forced unwillingly to see him. If he did not give alms to this man who lay in such grievous suffering and lived in such destitution, or rather for his whole life was troubled by chronic illness of the most serious kind, whom of those he encountered 
would he ever have been moved to pity? If the rich man doesn't have any pity for him, who would he ever have pity for? Would he have pity for the, you know, little children trying to raise money so they can go to college, you know, selling their magazines? Would they have pity for the children trying to raise money for their school because the school doesn't have enough? All those, you know, quote-unquote charities today. But he felt no such emotion but became harder hearted. Notice that. Comparative. <laughs> he, he wasn't just hard hearted. He became harder hearted and more reckless even than that unjust judge who knew neither fear of God nor shame before men. And he's talking about the parable of the woman who goes before the unjust judge and he doesn't listen to her. And Christ says, you know, so what do you do? You keep your complaining up until you get the relief. Because what does the unjust finally do? He gives in. No. Even persistence, top of 22, could not for man. All right? He, skipping down two lines, the poor man, begged the rich man to release him from hunger and not to ignore him as he lay dying. She, the woman in the other parable, pestered the judge. But he, the poor man, Lazarus, appeared to the rich man many times each day, lying in silence. Why? Because the parable never says that the poor man said, Oh, rich man, please help me. Christ never puts any words in the poor man's mouth. This is enough to soften even the heart of stone. It's like he just lays up and looks at him as the rich man steps over to go off wherever. This cruelty is the worst kind of wickedness. It is an inhumanity without rival. Okay. And Chrysostom talks a lot in his homilies about wickedness. And how he often describes wickedness is inhumanity. Wickedness is not acting like a human to other humans. It's not acknowledging their humanity. So, again, it's not the same thing, skipping a couple lines, it's not the same thing to see a poor man once or twice and pass him by. as to look at him every day and not be aroused by the persistent sight to mercy and generosity. Now, what is he saying there? Everybody in this room, I think, I could be wrong here, has probably had an experience once or twice of seeing somebody who's homeless or seeing somebody who's asking for a handout, asking for help, and have, have gone on by, not done anything, okay? But still, feeling that compunction or feeling that, that pity for them, okay? He says it's not the same thing to do that and pass somebody by once or twice, but to go and see somebody daily. And he doesn't give us a time frame, okay, or Christ doesn't give us a time frame in the parable, but Chrysostom does. Chrysostom seems to imply that this happened years. The rich man went in, came back, went in, came back, and for years he's having to see Lazarus by the side of the road. Okay? Top of 23. Nevertheless, he who lived in wickedness and inhumanity enjoyed every kind of good fortune, while the righteous man who practiced virtue endured the extremes of ill fortune. Well, how in the world did Lazarus practice virtue when all he's doing is lying there on the ground? Well, he's going to explain in a little while. For again, in Lazarus' case, we can prove that he was righteous, both by his end and by his patient endurance of poverty. Notice what Lazarus never does in the parable. Hey, you one percenter, that's my 99%. <laughs> He doesn't say it's unfair. He doesn't say, give me some of what you have. 
He doesn't say what you have is mine. He doesn't say you're rich because I'm poor. Nothing. He patiently endures. So, the rich man, however, didn't do anything. He refused to unload his cargo with discretion. His cargo. The weight he was carrying. Shall I tell you another wickedness? Because what he, what's he going on about here now? He's saying, um, we can prove Lazarus was righteous, etc. And he said, you know, the, ship, the rich man had a ship full of merchandise. He was hastening to his shipwreck. That is, to his death. And what could he have done? He could have unloaded the cargo. He could have unburdened himself. No. So let me tell you another wickedness. His daily luxurious and unscrupulous feasting. Here he is, a guy outside his window, hungry, full of sores, poor, can't move, and he's in there eating, you know, from this bountiful table, day in and day out. Okay? This is extreme wickedness. Not only now, ooh, there's a little dig at the congregation presently listening. Not only now, when such great wisdom is expected of us, but even at the beginning. And he goes back and quotes the book of Amos. The Jews think that the Sabbath is given to them for idleness. That is, to just rest, to not do anything. That's not the purpose. But in order that they may remove themselves from worldly cares and devote all their leisure to spiritual concerns. The priest, indeed, does double work on that day. Notice, the priest works on the Sabbath. While a single sacrifice is offered every day, on that day, he's bidden to offer a double sacrifice. The sacrifice in the Eucharist and the sacrifice of himself in his own time and such. Okay? Um, I'm going to skip some of that because I don't think we're going to run out of time. Let's see here. Actually, no, I'm not. Page 24. He's talking about um, the Jews and how their Sabbaths were false, etc. How did they make their Sabbaths false? By working wickedness, feasting, drinking, doing a multitude of shameful and grievous deeds. And he says, you need proof? Listen on. He, that is Christ, reveals what I am saying, um, or a Amos, reveals what I am saying by what he adds immediately. Who sleep upon beds of ivory and live delicately on their couches and eat kids out of the flocks and sucking calves out of the midst of the stalls, stalls who drink filtered wine and anoint yourselves with the best ointment? Okay, so what, what's his point in all that? Think about sleeping on beds of ivory. Drunkenness, greed, profligacy. Provide some pleasure, however small. That is, does drunkenness provide some pleasure? Yeah, sometimes. Okay. <laughs> Greed? Yeah, it feels good sometimes. Profligacy? Okay. But sleeping on beds of ivory, what pleasure is there? What's profligacy? Um, looseness. Yeah. Maybe. Licentiousness. <laughs> If you want, you know, you can even get really extreme and say just uh, sexual proclivity. Yeah. Pretty much move, sleeping with whatever moves. Right? So what kind of pleasure do you get from sleeping on a bed of ivory? That is, and we could translate ivory today to mahogany. You know, a nice expensive uh, endangered wood or teak or rosewood or something. Or, you know, playing a guitar that has teak or rosewood in the frets, you know. What does that do to you? Do you actually sleep better on that? No, it's the mattress that allows you to sleep better. So, what's the comfort? The beauty of the bed doesn't make our sleep sweeter or more pleasant, does it? No. The bed could be ugly as all get out. I mean, I've had couches before that look like they do belong on a front porch or in a backyard or in a landfill. It would have been the most comfortable couches there ever were. He says, no. No. 
because it is more beautiful, it's more onerous and burdensome if we have any sense. When you consider that while you sleep on a bed of ivory, someone else does not even enjoy sufficient bread, will your conscience not condemn you? You're sitting there, you're sleeping on your wonderful ivory bed, and there's Lazarus out in the dirt. Do you wish to see what makes a bed truly beautiful? I'll show you what makes a bed truly beautiful. Top of 25. The bed of the blessed David. Since Gregory brought him up. What kind of bed did he have? Not adorned all over with silver and gold, but with tears and confessions. I shall wash my bed every night. I shall water my couch with my tears. After he was caught in adultery with Bathsheba. Okay. So he fixes... the. Tears like pearls everywhere. In other words, it's the sleep of repentance and contrition and such. So, what should you do after you eat? He says, you shouldn't go to sleep. No, after you eat, page 25 in the middle, the time of leisure which everyone else uses for sleep, he, David, used for confession, praying, and tears. Okay, let me talk about another bed then. Okay, he loves to do this. Creates an image and it says, oh, that reminds me. If you've, ever, if you've ever seen the old TV show, Columbo with Peter Falk. It's like Peter Falk walking out the door going, oh, one more thing, sir. Jacob's bed. What bed does Jacob? It's when he's outside Bethel. And he has the dream, and he sees heaven open, and he sees the angels of God ascending and descending on a ladder. And then he, ra he, he wrestles with somebody. And what does he do? He puts his head on a stone. He had the bare ground beneath him and a stone under his head. And because of this, he saw the spiritual rock in that ladder by which angels ascended and descended. So how comfortable was his bed? If you've ever slept with a rock for your pillow, which I have before, backpacking, it can be quite unnerving <laughs> and uncomfortable. Why would you put your head on a rock? This is something I never understood, using a rock for your pillow. Sure, surely not. It elevates it. If you sleep on your side, otherwise you're like this, and you wake up, and you're not good. So, what about a soldier? Page 26. You are a spiritual soldier. This kind of soldier does not sleep on an ivory bed, but on the ground. What a, moreover, he's, he, now he's saying, okay, you guys, you're spiritual soldiers. You shouldn't smell like perfumed oils. Do soldiers smell like perfume? You must not smell of perfumes, but of virtue. Nothing is more clean for the soul than when the body has such a fragrance. That is, Chanel number no. five, or, you know, pick whatever, polo. When the devil attacks and breaks down the soul with self-indulgence, think the rich man, and fills it with great frivolity, then he wipes off the stain of his own corruption on the body, also with perfumes. In other words, the devil instills in the mind of the person, you know, you, you ought to make yourself smell. In existential actuality, <laughs> you reek. You're just really foul. So... Let your soul breathe a spiritual fragrance so that you may give the greatest benefit both to yourself and to your companions. It doesn't mean take a spiritual tic-tac <laughs> or lifesavers. There's nothing more grievous than luxury. Think about that. Nothing more grievous than luxury. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, on a, on a very everyday normal, I can think of a lot of things more grievous than luxury. <laughs> Okay? So, why? What does luxury do? Take heed, top of 27, that you forget not the Lord your God. In this way, luxury often leads to forgetfulness. In the old English epic poem Beowulf, Hrothgar tells a story about a guy who rises to power, becomes very great and powerful, and then his conscience falls asleep. Because he has everything he wants. He's like the guy here. 
Blessings are like flowing from a fountain onto him. And his conscience falls asleep. He forgets. Why? Because he's living in the lap of luxury. So, instead of that, fill your belly moderately that you may not become too heavy to bend your knees and call upon your God. Don't get big and fat like Jabba the Hutt. It's better to be thin because when you have to fall down on your knees and prostrate yourself before God, it makes it easier to get back up. How about you? I can't really picture Jabba the Hutt moving. <laughs> so, bottom of that page. Um... He talks about, you know, what you ought to do after you eat. You ought to go say prayers, blah, 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 blah. Uh, actually, go to page 28. He says, now let me make the denunciation of luxury more vehement and more pertinent to those who practice it. So let's go back to the sermon and to the story of Lazarus. Okay. So here is the rich man living in great luxury, but also in wickedness. Dressing splendidly. And what was the poor man doing meanwhile? The poor man, on the other hand, lay at his gate and did not become discouraged, blaspheme, or complain. He did not say to himself what many people say, What gives? He, the rich man, lives in wickedness, cruelty, inhumanity, enjoys everything more than he needs, does not endure even mental distress or any of the unexpected troubles, but gains pure pleasure. But I, poor Lazarus, cannot obtain a share even of necessary sustenance. In other words, it's like he's saying, 20 yards away, there is a home with untold wealth and untold stores of food. And I'm sitting here, and I'm hungry, and I'm thirsty, and I'm Sick, and I can't move, and where's the fairness in that? Everything flows to him as for, if from a fountain. Although he spends all his good on parasites, flatterers, and drunkenness, but I lie here and ignokers. A source of shame and derision, wasting away with hunger. Is this the work of providence? As St. John's way of saying, where's God? Does any justice oversee the deeds of mankind? He didn't say or think any of these things. But then notice what he immediately says. Because what do you think his audience is going to be thinking? Well, how do you know that? The scripture doesn't say anything about that. Here's how we know. Because the angels lead him to Abraham's bosom. And if he'd been saying all that stuff, the angels wouldn't have brought him. If he'd been a blasphemer, he would not have come to such honor. He says, no, in fact, but I can go even further than that. I can give you the exact number of chastisements he endured. Nine. He endured nine chastisements. Okay? Why? To make him more glorious. To make his life in the hereafter even more blessed. First chastisement, poverty. Poverty is a dreadful thing, all right? But that's not it. Next to it, illness. Illness was yoked to it. What else? He, Christ, showed that Lazarus's illness reached the same measure as his poverty. So they're, they're running neck and neck, beyond which it could not stretch out any farther. But then he said that dogs licked his sores. Lazarus was so much weakened that he could not even shoo the dogs away. Okay, now, think of how weak you have to be for that. He's lying there, and he can't even do this. And he can't kick out of it. Okay? If you've ever seen images, video images, of some of the concentration camp survivors that were rescued, okay, that were alive, they would be good, good examples for Lazarus. Okay. So that he lay like a living corpse, watching them coming without strength to protect himself from them. Hmm. So now you see poverty, disease, 
besieging his body to the extreme degree. Well, each of these is dreadful and unbearable. But woven together, think about how bad his life was. But here, both these misfortunes have run together. Now, what else? He had a lack of protectors, which made these other two misfortunes more grievous. That is, he doesn't have someone sitting around him kicking the dogs away. Keeping the dogs away. Keeping the flies away. So he's all alone in the world. All right? What else? Page 30. He did not obtain even ordinary concern from anyone. Not only the rich man. Even though he lay in the midst of so many drunkards and merrymakers, he came to feel his anguish more keenly and to same trials as he had. He sees people going in and out, and that just adds to his anguish. Why? Because any one of those people could have helped him. For there is no one to console him with a word or comfort him with a deed. After all, what does misery love? Company. No friend, no neighbor, no relative, not even an onlooker. Why? Because the rich man's whole household was corrupt. The sight of another person in good fortune laid on him an extra burden of anguish. He received a keener perception of his own troubles, not only by comparing his own misfortune with the rich man's prosperity, but also by considering that the rich man fared well in all respects. He has friends, he has power, he has money, he has food, he has clothing. He's got everything. And it makes it even worse for Lazarus because the rich man is doing very well in life. Yet, Lazarus knows the rich man is cruel and inhumane. Why do the evil prosper and the good die young? While he, Lazarus, suffered extreme evils with virtue and goodness. So because of this, he endured inconsolable distress. Top of the next page. You, you need another evil? <laughs> Have I not listed enough? How about this one? He couldn't observe another Lazarus. He couldn't look at somebody else and say, oh, well, you know, he's worse off than I am. It means Lazarus is the worst, worst off there is. Finding companions in our sufferings, either in fact or in story, notice, brings a great consolation to those in anger. But he could not see anyone else who had suffered the same trials as he had. As he, had. he could not even hear of anyone among his ancestors. This is enough to darken one's soul. He couldn't even go, yeah, well, you know, there was that story about Oedipus. You know, he had it pretty bad. Killed his father, slept, married his mother, produced his brothers and sisters as his sons and daughters. Ew. <laughs> he could not console himself, moreover, with any thought of resurrection. Why? Because he believed that the present situation was closed within the present life. Because he lived before the time of grace. He lived before the coming of Christ. So he didn't think of a resurrection. So what does he have to look forward to, to living such a wonderful, beautiful, virtuous life? You die, but now, Chrysostom says, among us, we have much more knowledge, both the good hope of the resurrection and the retribution to come. But I'm not done yet with counting out the evils attributed to him, or given to him. There was even something more in addition to these evils. Namely, his reputation was slandered by foolish people. Because what did they do? What did they say? You must have had it coming. What did Job's three friends say to Job? What did you do to piss off God? You obviously did something. You anger God, otherwise this wouldn't be happening. Even Beowulf thinks that when the dragon comes in the epic story. Beowulf immediately thinks, what did I do? What wrong did I do? Rather than just seeing that it might just be time for the dragon to come. Okay? 
Most people, when they see someone in hunger, chronic illness, and the extremes of misfortune, now keep in mind, this is a preacher delivering a homily. Everything the preacher says in the homily is designed to work on the audience. So he's telling his audience, don't be fools. Don't make these kinds of rash judgments. Most people do not even allow him a good reputation, but judge his life by his troubles. And so if you judge people's lives by their troubles, someone who's having a hard life, what do you assume? Ha ha ha, you deserved it. And somebody who's not having a hard life, what do you assume? Oh, they're blessed by God. God wants everybody to be like this, and he doesn't want anybody to be like this. Until, of course, you look at the example of Christ, <laughs> who's not like this, but instead was poor. Okay? Didn't even have a home. Homeless, in other words. And think that he is surely in such misery because of wickedness. For if, of course, if this man were dear to God, he would not have left him to suffer in poverty and the other troubles. Okay, that's like saying, well, if the apostles were loved by God, none of them would have died horrific, painful deaths. Okay? So, skipping over about a little over a page, in the middle of that first paragraph on 33, notice what he says. Many people use these phrases continually. Where? Look at the places that he says. Workshops, marketplace, and houses. What does he mean by those three places? And, they, and the kinds of comments they are making are, this person is suffering because he has done something against God. This person is, is experiencing great joys because God is pleased with him. In their daily, everyday, ordinary lives. Meaning, this is what they really think. This is what they really believe. So that, you will even hear people say today, Something horrible happens to them, and they're like, oh, it's God getting me back at me. Because I, would you quit doing that? Because I've done something wrong. Okay? I haven't done this, or I have done that, etc. This is a mark of extreme unbelief, he says. Of mania, and of a childish disposition. Because what's it attempting to do? It's tempting to say, oh, cause, effect. But we can't see everything in our lives as cause and effect. If I walk out that door and get in my car and get killed in a car wreck on my way home from work, you know, you could go, well, you know, he deserved it, you know, teaching this class because of whatever, okay? But it's, it's pretty strong. Right, but people say, people say that. I mean, look at what Jerry Falwell and others said after 9-11. They deserved it. Or we deserved it. You know, uh, Reverend Wright, you know, it's our chickens coming home to roost for all the bad and evil that the United States has done. What do you say? He points out to his congregation. Tell me. Come on. Fess up. If the rich man departs and is punished hereafter, has he made one for one? That is, did he get the corresponding punishment? How do you figure? How many years do you want to suppose he's enjoyed his money in this life? He's not talking literal years. He's saying, really, how much pleasure did he enjoy in this life? I'm willing to say 200, 300, twice as many, maybe even a thousand. That is, he had enough joys and pleasures to last him maybe a thousand years. You can't show me, can you, a life here which has no end, which understands no limit, like the life of the righteous hereafter. So what does he say? A moment here is what? It's like a dream. He says, as one dream is to a hundred years, so the present life is to the future life. In fact, that's not even good enough. As a drop is to the boundless sea, so much a thousand years are to that future glory and enjoyment. Okay? So, he goes on and talks about the punishment to come. And those who practice wickedness and live in sin are punished 
here, not in the life to come. Yes, they will be punished in the life to come. But how are they also punished here? And he uses the example of an adulterer. So the adulterer goes and cheats on his wife, and then what happens? What's he always afraid of? She's going to find out. The other woman's husband's going to find out. And so what's he always doing? He's always looking behind his shoulder. He's always on the lookout. The same happens to those who practice, should be practiced, not practic, theft and fraud to drunkards, to everyone who lives in sin, meaning all of us, okay, to all of us sinners, to his entire congregation. For the righteous, both the life hereafter and this life provide pleasure. But to the wicked and greedy, both wicked and greediness are experienced here. Punishment is here and hereafter. Okay? So, page 35 in the middle. In contrast, even if the righteous suffer a multitude of troubles here, they're nourished by good hopes and have a pleasure that is pure, secure, and permanent. Hereafter, the multitude of good things will welcome them, just like Lazarus. A person is not loathsome if he has this kind of wounds on his body, but if he has a multitude of sores on his soul and takes no care of them. That is, if he lets something else lick those sores, and he talks about the demons. So he says, let us be wise. How? Let us not say that if God loved so-and-so, he would not have allowed him to become poor. For here's the greatest example of God's love. God disciplines those whom he loves. Okay? Um, let's see here. Page 37. Now he's going to get... To, into it a little bit deeper and talk about what he means by the rich and the poor, the virtuous and the wicked. He says uh, at the top of the page, robbers often have escaped the hands of men. Nevertheless, even knowing this, we would have prayed both for ourselves and for our enemies to avoid that life with its cursed affluence. Because he says being rich is being a robber. Because like St. Basil said, you're robbing somebody else of something they have a right to. Collecting all these thoughts in your minds, therefore, my beloved, let's call fortunate, not the wealthy, but the virtuous. So here's how he's going to deal ultimately with wealth and poverty. The wealthy are those who are full of virtue. And the poor just the opposite. Those who are full of wickedness or vice. Well, how does it how do you be full of vice or wickedness? Let's examine not the outer garments, but the conscience of each person. Let's pursue the virtue and joy which come from righteous actions, and let us, both rich and poor, emulate Lazarus. Notice he doesn't condemn the financially wealthy because he says you can be financially wealthy and virtuous. You can be financially wealthy and wicked. You can be financially poor and wicked. And you can be financially poor and virtuous. So, um, No, it's he says, um, this man, the Lazarus, did not endure just one or two or three tests of virtue, but very many. He was poor, he was ill, he had no one to help him. He remained in a house which could have relieved all his troubles, but was granted no word of comfort. He saw the man who neglected him, enjoying luxury, etc., etc. So, not for two or three days, but for his whole life, he saw himself in this situation, and the rich man in the opposite. And what did he do? What did Lazarus do? He took it. He took it. He took the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that Hamlet talks about. Okay? 
What excuse will we have when this man endured all the misfortunes at once with such courage if we will not bear even the half of these? Okay. For this reason, Christ set him before us. So that, this is the reason, so that whatever troubles we encounter, seeing in this man a greater measure of tribulation, we may gain enough comfort and consolation from his wisdom and patience. In other words, if he could endure this, surely I can endure a cold. I can endure the flu. I can endure whatever is happening. He stands forth as a single teacher of the whole world for those who suffer any misfortune whatever. Whatever that misfortune is. Offering himself for all to see. So, let us talk of Lazarus continually in councils, at home, in the marketplace, and everywhere. Let's replace all of our speech about those lucky rich people and those poor, poor people, lucky because they're blessed by God, poor because God is angry at them. Let's replace all that talk with talk about Lazarus and how we can learn from Lazarus. Let us carefully examine all the wealth which comes from this parable so that we may both pass through the present troubles without grief and attain to the good things which are to come. There's another old English poem you know how much I love old English stuff, called Dior. Okay? And in this poem Dior, the speaker is a shope, okay, a poet, minstrel if you want, who talks about you know, all this bad stuff that has happened in the world. And it's the only poem in Old English that has um, a refrain. Okay? And the refrain is... That was over, over, and swath this is me, which means literally that was passed over, so this may be. That was overcome, so may this be. And each of the, the, the stanzas essentially are horrible things that happen to people. Well, the last one is, oh yeah, and I was Dior, and I was the minstrel at a court, and I lost my job, and this other guy took my place. That was overcome, so may this be. It's what's called a consolatio, okay? That's what John Chrysostom wants people to get out of the story of Lazarus. Lazarus overcame his troubles, and nobody else's troubles can come anywhere close to his. Okay? So, put yourself in Lazarus' shoes, turn Lazarus' story into gold for your soul, and move on. Next homily. Notice, I was impressed by your goodwill when I preached the earlier sermon on Lazarus. In other words, he seems to be suggesting it was positively received. So, you approve the patience of the poor man. You abhor the cruelty of the rich man. This shows virtue on your part. Okay. And man, even if we don't seek virtue, but we at least praise it, that means maybe you, we can attain it. So he seems to be suggesting not everybody tried to live virtuously, but they thought, you know, it's pretty good. And he says, you know, that's the beginning. What else? You saw him then at the gate. That is when, we, when I left you off. We saw him then at the gate of the rich man. Now, let's talk about the rest of the parable, or more of the parable. And what do we see? Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. Okay? He was kicked. He, you saw him there, licked by dogs. Now, see him carried in triumph by the angels. Notice the, the oppositions, the juxtapositions he keeps using. You saw him in poverty then, see him in luxury now. You saw him in hunger, see him in great abundance. You saw him striving in the contest, see him crowned with victory. You saw his suffering, see his recompense. All right? 
This man is presented as a teacher for you both. You both who? You rich and you poor. For if he did not complain when he was poor, what pardon will those have who complain when they are rich? If he gave thanks and hunger and so many troubles, what excuse will those have who do not try to approach the same virtue when they enjoy abundance? Because what did he say in the previous homily about those who are living in, in abundance, in luxury? They forget God. So, uh, what pardon will the poor have who grumble and complain because they have to beg for a living when this man didn't complain or beg at all? So, I'm going to tell you the truth, he says. The rich man is not the one who's collected many possessions but the one who needs few possessions. Needs, not wants. Okay? The poor man is not the one who has no possessions, but the one who has many desires. Because what is the problem with desires? They can't be filled. If you're always wanting something, you will always be wanting something. All right? Which is why the early church fathers, well, even later ones, taught so much about apotheia, uh, apatheia, okay? Dispassion. It doesn't mean what we modern word we get from it. It doesn't mean apathetic. Apathetic means I don't give a damn. Okay? Dispassion means you no longer have any desires. You no longer have any passion. It's what the Buddha taught. Okay? So, what's he getting at? The poor man is the one who has no possessions, but the one, not the one who has no possessions, but the one who has many desires. We ought to consider this the definition of poverty and wealth. So, on wealth and poverty, on... The one who needs few possessions and the one who wants <laughs> more possessions. We're accustomed to judge poverty and affluence by the disposition of the mind. But by the measure of one's substance, excuse me, we are accustomed to judge poverty and affluence by the disposition of the mind, not by the measure of one's substance. Skip a few more lines. Those who are satisfied with what they have and pleased with their own possessions do not have their eyes on the substance of others, even if they're the poorest of all, should be considered the richest of all. How many of you are familiar with Harry Potter? How many of you have read the first novel? Some of you have, at least. The very end of the novel, just before the very end, Harry um, goes and looks in the mirror of Erised, and Albus Dumbledore is there. And Dumbledore tells Harry that the happiest man in the world would look in the mirror of Erised, which is the mirror of, you know, thing that shows you your heart's desire, would look in that and see himself as he is. In other words, because he has no, no desires, he wouldn't see anything else. He would just see himself, okay? Dumbledore tells Harry when he looks into it, what does he see? A pair of woolen socks, because that's what he wants, apparently, all right? I think there's a little tongue-in-cheek going on there. At the end of the novel, after the Philosopher's Stone is destroyed, and Harry comes to understand that Dumbledore's friend, Nicholas Flamel, is going to die and stuff because he doesn't have any more of the um, elixir of life, Dumbledore tells Harry, you know, the Sorcerer's Stone or Philosopher's Stone really wasn't such a good thing after all. He says, think about it. As much money and life as you could want. The only problem is humans do have a knack for choosing precisely those things which are worst for them. As much money in the world, as much life in the world, what does he mean? He means eternal life here, not dying. Money, as much money in the world, okay? So if as much money in the world and eternal life here, not dying, immortality, are the two worst things that one could want. Turn that over, what would be the two best things one could want? 
poverty and death or poverty and to be able to accept death. Okay? Look at what he said here again. Those who are satisfied with what they have and pleased with their own possessions do not have their eyes on the substance of others, even if they're the poorest of all, should be considered the richest. For whoever has no need of others' property but is happy to be self-sufficient is the most affluent of all. The person who can get by with what they have. So if you agree, let's get back to our, our sermon, our parable. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels. And he says, okay, now I need to go off onto another tangent. Because a lot of simple people think that if you die a violent death, your soul becomes a demon. He goes, it's an utter lie. It's literally, he's going to say, a lie from the pit of hell. Why? Because he's going to say, at the bottom of the page, the devil introduces this idea to abolish the glory of the martyrs. Because how do martyrs generally die? Horrible, violent deaths. Okay? So, um, let's get back to where we were. Page 42, towards the bottom, about a fourth of the way or a third of the way from the bottom. He's talking about Christ, and, and he's talking about what he previously said about the demons. He says, don't ever trust the demons. When the demon said to him, we know who you are, that is when they spoke to Christ, what did Christ do? He rebuked them. Even when the demon said, what have we to do with you, son of the most high God? Notice the demon is acknowledging there who Christ says he himself is. He doesn't say, hey, shut up. Quit spreading lies. No, he just says, quiet. Don't tell anybody. Why? Never trust a demon, even if he tells you something healthful. Learning from this, let us not trust a demon at all. But even when he utters something healthful, flee, avoid him. So somebody then asks, well, okay, then how do people sin if they don't suffer for us? That is, if the demon doesn't, you know, Flip Wilson used to do a thing in his old, TV, in his old yeah, TV show in the 70s. You know, he'd dress up as Geraldine and say, the devil made me do it, baby. You know, whatever problem, it was the devil putting me up to it. No. How do people sin? Willingly, intentionally, surrendering themselves, not by necessity or compulsion. Okay? They choose. So from this, it's clear we have the power to trust or not to trust his, the devil's, advice. We do not submit to any necessity or compulsion from him. All right? Go to the bottom of 44. Um, God goes on, uh, he goes on, and he brings in, he goes on, and he brings in the parable that we talked about with St. Basil, the parable of the rich man who had the barns. Okay, And he says, are you listening to this in silence? I'm much happier if you are, because what does that mean? You know, you're starting to get some virtue. If that rich man had had someone to give him this kind of advice, that is, if either the rich man in the Lazarus story or the rich man who built all the barns had had someone to give him this kind of advice, instead of flattery, he's always suggested what he wanted to hear and who dragged him into luxurious living, he would not have fallen into that hell, nor undergone the unendurable torments. Okay? So, I wish we could always and continually preach like this and speak about hell. To scare it out of them. So, he says, okay, now we're, we're at this point in the homily, while we're here, we have good hopes. Why does, while we are here on earth, we have good hopes. We have hope for something better. Yeah. I, I just thought it was interesting that, you know, up until this point, we haven't really had anybody really talking about hell or demons or anything like that. Like, even, 
even uh, St. Athanasius was not really that interested in that. I thought that was... A lot of the fathers aren't. Yeah, and, and it's funny, but here he, you know, he's pretty, you know, he's pretty forward with it. He, uh, he's a... Chrysostom is much more a moral theologian. Yeah. I mean, he is trying trying to change belief systems to get people to choose the better better way. And he does bring in hell frequently. But, but as I said, many of the fathers don't address hell because they don't they, they don't argue that one should choose on the basis of fear. They argue one should choose on the basis of love. That God is to be more than anything loved and that you desire God with all of the, the love that you can muster rather than fear him because you're sinners in the hands of an angry God hanging over the pit of hell by this, you know, little thin spider web thread like Jonathan Edwards suggests, right? So he says, but while we're here, we still have good hope. When we depart to that place, that is, when we die, time for choosing is gone. The option of repentance, washing away our misdeeds, gone. For this reason, we must continually make ourselves ready <coughs> here. It's what St. Ephraim was talking about, you know, in terms of virtuous actions here. The future is unknown. Why? To keep us always active in the struggle and prepared for that removal. It's like when Christ talks about, you know, when the end will come. And what does he say? Be alert. Be on the watch. He says, I don't even know when the end will come. Only the Father knows that. Okay? What's he not saying? Sit around and write books and try and figure out when the end will be. <laughs> Have conferences, you know. He doesn't. Late great. Billboards. Yeah, don't <laughs> don't sit there and try and you know read the book of Revelation and come up with some calculus with the years and the dates and everything. Ah, let's all go off to the mountain, you know, dress in white because. <laughs> and then inexplicably start a new denomination. They've been wrong every time. <laughs> every time they have been wrong. Right. So, what's he saying? It's our job now to struggle. For this reason, Lazarus was led away with such great honor. Why? Because he patiently endured. The rich man also died and was buried, just as his soul had lain buried in his body like a tomb. His body, which got fat from the luxury, became his grave. For by shackling the flesh with drunkenness and gluttony as if with change, chains, he had made it useless and dead. You know, and I, I can't help but wonder, did Scrooge, did Dickens somehow know this? And so that when he portrays Jacob Marley with all the chains around, and Marley says, these are the chains I built up during life. Okay. And, and he wanders forever with them? So, power, uh, top 46. So the power of gold is tested, and of all superfluous wealth. What does he mean? What good did the gold do the rich man? From such a crowd of attendants, he was led away naked and alone. The attendants there doesn't mean his friends. The attendance means his wealth. He had, like, like he had gold piled all around him when he died. And as in the Middle English drama, drama every man, his wealth doesn't help him at all when he dies. It stops at the grave. Since he could not take anything with him out of such abundance, nor was he led away with any companion or guide. He didn't have any virtue to help carry him in. Death came and quenched all those luxuries. It took him like a captive and led him hanging its head low, groaning with shame, unable to speak, 
trembling, afraid, and the frit, frit man, the rich man became a suppliant to the poor man. Now, notice, did Lazarus ever beg from the rich man? No. And now what do we see? The rich man's getting his comeuppance, and he's going, please, Lazarus, help me. But he's not begging Lazarus. He's begging Abraham. He begged from the table of this man who earlier had gone hungry and been exposed to the mouths of dogs. So in this life, poverty and wealth, he says, are only masks. They're only images. So, sitting in this world, as if in a theater, top of the next page, and looking at the players on the stage, when you see many rich people, don't think that they're really rich. But they're wearing the masks of rich people. Just as that man who acts the part of king or general on the stage often turns out to what? To be a nobody, a household servant, or a general, or, or somebody who sells figs or grapes. Take off his mask, open up his conscience, and what do you see? You'll often find there a great poverty of virtue. I shouldn't say this. I really, really shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. An example, I think, of someone who's a very rich man that if we could pull the face off and look in the conscience, I really shouldn't say this. <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> I mean, maybe Gates, you know, does all this charity. And I know Trump does all kinds of charity kind of stuff too. But the persona is, give it all to me. I mean, you know, better example. Hugh Hefner. That'd be a better example. Yeah. Okay. So, what will you find? You'll find that he belongs to the lowest class of all. So now when death arrives, the theater is dissolved, everyone takes off their masks, and when all are judged by what? Their deeds alone. Because every time in the Gospels, when Christ talks about judgment, what does he never talk about? Never. He never talks about what you believed. He never talks about what you knew. He never talks about, could you recite, you know, the books of the Bible, forwards, backwards, in Hebrew, in Greek, you know. What does he always talk about? Did you do the will of the Father? Which is always in good works to the poor, to the least of these, etc. Okay? So, what could be poorer than this poverty? That is, to have the mask stripped away and to be empty. So, raising his eyes, it's the bottom of page 47, raising his eyes to Abraham, he says, Father, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the finger of his water in water and let, let a drop fall into my mouth. Now think about this for a moment. Lazarus, who just a few minutes before, looked like what? I mean, he was your classic age poster. Sores all over thin, emaciated dogs licking his wounds, and he says, dip his finger so that he could drop some water on me. All right? Notice he doesn't ask Lazarus. He asks Abraham, and he addresses Abraham properly. Father. Okay? So why doesn't he address Lazarus? Because he's ashamed. Why is he ashamed? Oops. <laughs> Should have helped alleviate some of his pain back then. Okay. So what happens? Look at the bottom of 48. No, we've only got a couple minutes. We'll finish this on Thursday. He's saying, Christ says, I sent the poor man Lazarus to your gate to teach you virtue and to receive your love. In other words, why was Lazarus poor, decrepit, sick, etc.? So that the rich man could learn virtue. Well, it sucks to be Lazarus then. Okay. You ignored this benefit, declined to use his assistance toward your salvation. Notice what Chrysostom is saying. No one is saved by themselves. Okay. No one is saved alone, singly. People are saved in relationship to other people. That is, other people 
according to Chrysostom, are the source of my salvation or your salvation or whoever's salvation. Okay? Now, that's pretty radical to a modern 21st century mind. What's he saying? We are all in it together. We cannot do anything totally on our own. It's not the modern you know, Christian image of simply going off into your room and asking Jesus into your heart. It is not only asking Jesus into your heart, but then listening to what Jesus says to do for your neighbor. Period. Okay? So, hereafter you shall use him to bring yourself a greater punishment and retribution. Ow! Hereafter, you're going to see Lazarus, and he's going to be living it up. He's going to be whooping it up in heaven, enjoying that great marriage feast of the Lamb. And what's going to be happening to you? It's going to be kind of toasty down there. From the poor man, we learn that all who suffer curses and injustice among us will stand before us in that other life. Before us, that is, before. In front of us, the place of preference. Okay, uh, we'll stop there. We'll pick up with forty-nine. There's only five more pages, five or six pages, and then we'll start. I don't know how far. We'll try and get through three and four next time. Uh, three and four are only about forty pages total, so we'll see what happens. All right.